All right, I've talked a bit about uh, the uh, change conditions of the 1970s and the economic conditions that struck uh, the theater, especially Broadway, and um, the aesthetic and political, cultural uh, changes that um, uh, took place in the 1960s and into the 70s. And the theater was responding in different ways. I wanted to talk about how authors responded to uh, the circumstances of the 1970s and uh, stress that uh, even though uh, the 60s and the 70s produced all this distrust of language and the text and stabilized ways of, of, of uh, inscribing uh, human experience and representing it, that nevertheless, authors were a lively um, uh, contributor to a new way of understanding how uh, theater could work. Uh, so I wanted to discuss some of these strategies employed by different authors. And I could talk about many more authors than I will uh, because the authors were extremely busy. Um, and you had more plays produced uh, uh, since the 60s than at any time uh, previously. Uh, just the burgeoning of playwriting uh, energy. Uh, but as I said earlier, many uh, 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 playwriting was um, uh, so diffuse, you might say, that it could never build the kinds of s s star authors that we um, uh, that were um, a feature of the 1950s and earlier decades uh, with people like Eugene O'Neill and Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller. Anyway. Uh, many authors uh, contributed to all kinds of new ways of understanding how text could work in the theater. So I wanted to uh, mention Rolf Hochhut, a German author, uh, born in 1931. He's uh, been very prolific since uh, his first play, The Deputy, in 1963. But he's famous for Did the he? that um, was a very controversial play insofar as it uh, dramatized the what uh, Hokut, a Protestant, uh, believed was the complicity of the Vatican, the Catholic Church, in the Holocaust, and that the the Pope uh, in. Um, the Vatican at the time of World War II uh, conspired with the Nazis and, um, to uh, uh, implement the, the Holocaust and the eradication of Jews in Europe. What was unique about this play, it's huge, it goes on for six hours, enormous play with many, many characters and um, uh, uh, very difficult to produce, but nevertheless people attempted it in the 1963, 64 uh, and put up with all the controversies that ensued from it. But the big thing about Hulk was that he, uh, for large sections of it, he didn't write the words. He took actual documented words from archival sources. He took the words that people actually said or wrote and put it into the mouths of the characters on the stage, the sort of montage or collage of true statements, or, well, let's not say true statements, documented statements, statements he didn't write, but which were uh, documented in the form of memos and um, uh, uh, messages and communications in archives from World War II and built his case about the, the way in which the Vatican uh, 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 conspired with the Nazis uh, to uh, implement the Holocaust from words that were said by people in the Vatican and in Gestapo files and in the archives in Berlin and so forth. So it's very interesting and subsequent playwrights have adopted this technique of taking uh, um, uh, documented uh, language and inserting it into play and then organizing other people's words in a way that suits their own, uh, the author's political uh, purpose or artistic purpose. Uh, 
Uh, very interesting technique uh, that's subsequently been applied by different authors in relation to different political themes. It's primarily authors with a political motive in writing their plays. Um, but that was, a, that was one author driven strategy for um, um, uh, uh, asserting the, the, the authority of the text in uh, the theater. Another author driven sta uh, strategy was to uh, work with small cast plays. Uh, the cost of as I mentioned in earlier videos, the cost of, of uh, uh, doing theater was not getting cheaper. You didn't have the economies of scales whereby theater could somehow reduce the cost of, of uh, making plays, uh, especially the intense uh, uh, labor costs. So playwrights began working with smaller casts and coming up with inventive ways in which smaller casts could do more, such as the doubling of roles or the tripling of roles. That is, they, they deliberately wanted to see how um, characters were embedded within each other and how actors were embedded within different kinds of characters and give opportunities for actors to play more than one role. Usually this was a effort on the part of producers to cover large casts uh, with few actors in the past, but now authors began deliberately uh, creating um, a text in which uh, the same actor played different characters. And uh, that became a basis for a different way of evaluating not only performers, but authorial imagination and how to see the relation between characters as sort of unified by the person playing those roles. And we'll see a very good example of this later on in the semester with Carol Churchill's Cloud Nine. Uh, but um, another feature of this small cast kind of, uh, of aesthetic is that um, you had a breakdown in the skill at developing dialogue and a lot of emphasis on monologues and separating characters from each other so that they are um, um, alone on stage even though they may be seen uh, with a group of other actors on stage but those actors don't interact very well with each other except perhaps it's like a chorus. And the chorus line from 1976 is a primary example of this approach where uh, uh, you have nine separate stories of dancers in a Broadway chorus line. They just come out and talk and sing their song and say their life story and then they step back into the chorus line and they're all together but they aren't interacting with each other in terms of the dialogue uh, that we expect from um, most plays in which uh, language is a way of connecting people to each other. The chorus line, it's, it's basically dance and movement that connects people to each other. Language separates them and keeps them apart. That's also Trophy. another big, big play from the 1970s, 1976 in fact. And Tozaki Shange's For Color Girls Who Have Considered Suicide. Enormous hits, still played off. I asked you to see a little uh, uh, clip from the movie version. But here again, uh, Shange's um, focus was on the unique experiences of, of black women and trying to differentiate the qualities of life that different black women um, experience coming from different backgrounds, different aspirations, and so forth. The characters are all on stage together, but they really don't interact. It's like moving from one monologue to another monologue, and uh, the viewer, the spectator, sees the different characters in relation to each other, but the characters themselves don't really um, connect with each other in, a, in, a, in either a physical or a um, uh, or through language. 
but the monologues are always memorable and indeed actors today, students, learn monologues from that uh, play uh, in order to um, do scenes. But that led to a kind of asymmetry in the distribution of language uh, in the theater where you have a great many powerful monologues emerging in theater from the 1970s into the 80s and still now into the 90s, 2000s, where authors seem to know what they want characters to uh, reveal in terms of some big chunk of language coming out of them, but skill at, at dialogue is really uh, interaction and uh, swift exchange of words and so forth, that's increasingly uh, rare art and an uh, extraordinary skill. Uh, although many are attempting it, it just does not uh, seem as if we are living in an era in which uh, monologue, uh, or which dialogue and ability to dramatize conflict through the um, uh, uh, Engaging, engrossing exchange of languages is 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 all that uh, all that prominent or all that powerful. Anyway, uh, let me mention a couple of dramatists who are very skillful at showing us this asymmetry in which one person seems to dominate and control the language of dramatic action. Thomas Bernhard, an Austrian writer, known primarily for his um, novels a rather um, misanthropic uh, author, uh, uh, kind of uh, cynical and filled with uh, and uh, constantly um, uh, articulating a bitter perspective on the world, a sense of profound disappointment in human beings. Monologues are especially good at um, representing this sense of disillusionment, disappointment, this bitterness. And um, authors seem to be fond of uh, finding that moment in a play where they have their monologues that bring out all of this sense of being alone and estranged from the rest of humanity. And, and Bernhardt was an absolute master of this kind of drama whereby <laughs> Uh, Richard de Neville's or The Hunting Society, uh, those are a couple of his plays. Um, uh, uh, Celebration of Boris, that's another one. We have a character that's sitting on stage listening, and another character who just goes on and on talking and, and, and complaining, and it's a rant on the whole play and this can be very engaging uh, but the main point is that you get this big asymmetry this of uh, distribution between language one person consumes it or is the listener and another person just seems to be owning it uh, dominating it controlling it um, and yet revealing the sort of the powerlessness of language to change the situation. The person is constantly complaining that things aren't going right and that there's some conjunction between this huge dominating uh, uh, control over language and a complementary uh, sense of powerlessness or defeat. Um, that's Thomas Bernhard. But other American authors have uh, uh, Sam Shepard is another one with powerful monologues, a bit more skillful with the dialogue, and he um, uh, has uh, focused, you might say, on the decay of myths about the, the Old West. In fact, one of his most famous plays is True West. Buried Child is another one. He's done many plays, uh, very long and successful career in uh, Hollywood, married to uh, Jessica Lang for a while. And I'm sure you've seen him in um, uh, movies or television shows because he's, he's been very successful there. He is one example of the actor who writes. And he's been in film uh, since very uh, young. He started out young, at the age of 23, he was getting his plays done in New York City and working in movies at the age of 23, writing scripts from uh, Zabriskie Point, uh, uh, Michelangelo, Antonio. Film back in, when was that? 1970 or something. Uh, 
But uh, here again, although his themes are focused on somehow people losing uh, contact with some mythic past uh, or uh, in conflict, another theme of his is um, Hollywood and um, uh, the way in which Hollywood is a constructor of myths and how uh, that uh, machine we call Hollywood uh, changes people or uh, causes them to lose confidence in whatever myths they had before from their background or um, connected to their origins in the West or in, in the rural part of America. Uh, but in any case, uh, this uh, struggle between uh, uh, a mythic past or a mythic culture and um, uh, the, the failure to sustain it in the myth uh, urges uh, uh, Shepard to concentrate uh, the, the language into monologues where you get again, uh, as with Bernhard, this, um, this kind of eruption of disappointment or despair uh, or complaint or anger, you might say. But it's about the asymmetry of, of, of language. I must also mention Tom Stoppard, uh, born in Czechoslo uh, Czechoslovakia, what was Czechoslovakia back in 1937. But he's an English citizen and an English playwright. Very skillful. Uh, he was good with dialogue, um, but uh, from um, Stoppard's perspective, language is about game playing. It's about skill mm -hmm. and cleverness with words uh, in order to um, uh, manipulate people into um, uh, achieving some kind of, um, oh, you might say, insulated condition, insulated um, life from a, a world in which uh, language otherwise fails to bring any kind of happiness or success. Uh, so he has very often very intelligent characters exchanging words, a lot of puns, innuendos, and clever organizations of words. Uh, and. Um, uh, uh, often builds these kinds of monologues that are almost like literary critiques of other people's language, use of language. Uh, and uh, for that reason, uh, Stoppard has always had this loyal or devoted audience uh, that appreciates this um, intelligence, you might say, this, this uh, self-conscious use of language and um, effort to sort of dissect theatrically how people use words to deceive each other as to their um, either their qualities but uh, their motives and uh, uh, he's used a variety of historical settings as well as contemporary settings to uh, make uh, use of this uh, talent for um, game playing through language, um, um, but uh, in uh, any case, um, he has established the, you might say, the uh, power of a self-conscious use of language to attract uh, a long, uh, an audience for a, a, a very devoted and very smart audience for a long time. He goes back to the 1960s, Rosencrantz and Gilderstern, one of his early places, 1965. He's still busy, he's in the 70s now, I guess, uh, and um, uh, still producing plays. Uh, I do want to mention David Mamet as a very significant uh, playwright uh, emerging out of the 1970s and one who has moved away 
from the focus on monologue and asymmetrical distribution of language among characters, he's really one to focus on dialogue uh, and it's often very intense and very kind of aggressive. Uh, his themes are always really focused on men and their competition with each other uh, for um, wealth for or for women. And these are men who don't resort to huge reservoirs of language within themselves to establish their identity. They're often not that articulate. But they got something to say anyway, and they, he, he sort of, Mamis sets up fights between, or duels between men using language, whether it's in some kind of small time crime environment like American Buffalo from 1975, uh, to um, uh, Glen Gary, uh, Glenn Ross, his uh, Pulitzer Prize winning play about uh, real estate salesmen um, uh, competing with each other for uh, sta status and as well as wealth. Although that play does have its monologues in it. Uh, um, or some of the movies. He's also done some uh, many movies. He's a uh, uh, career spans more than just the Broadway theater in which he's been successful. And, and um, but my point is, he has uh, unique among uh, authors since the '70s. Really concentrated on developing this um, uh, exchange of language through dialogue, developing conflict through dialogue. At the same time, it's a kind of constrained dialogue. It's uh, because the characters don't have much in the way of intellectual or um, uh, material resources on which to solve their problems in life, uh, they aren't able to um, articulate much more than this sense of competition and doubt about their 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 uh, ability to solve their problems. So it's a very intense kind of dialogue, but it also is a very um, uh, exclusive kind of world that he creates. He's not, I don't think, particularly successful at um, dramatizing sexual relations or finding a place for women in his plays. These are kind of secondary or undeveloped, you might say. Um, uh, and his themes and his view of life is not that broad. Uh, and in a way that shows sort of the um, difficulty of authors to find a dialogue, a way of exchanging language between characters that opens up the world rather than describes a very closed, deeply encoded uh, world uh, such as uh, David Maimon um, uh, uh, so presents or puts on in, into, his, um, into his dramas. A uh, couple of other uh, author-driven strategies for uh, the postmodern theater. There's often the uh, cinematic structuring of action with short scenes in largely abstract or schematic spaces. Don't depend on a lot of scenery and vivid imagery on the stage. Be able to take a scene and put it in as barren a space as the one as we're in right now, where you don't depend on a lot of resources to make the scene work. Language, sort of the focus, get rid of all the scenery, and find a schematic or abstract way in which to create your drama because that's the way in which to get your play performed. If you require a lot of resources, people are going to be very skeptical and say, well, uh, it costs too much money to put on your play uh, and we don't know how it's going to uh, find an audience. So the more you can build drama uh, around words alone from the author's perspective, the more likely you are to have opportunities to see your play performed. And that's one hey. thing that's unique to the United States uh, is that um, 
uh, writing, <laughs> writing a play means getting it performed, not getting it published. And if you cannot get your play performed, it's as if your play doesn't really exist. In Europe, uh, there's this tradition of the literary play where authors write plays that are just meant to be published and read. Although that tradition, even in Europe, seems to be dying out or fading uh, away. But authors, more than anything, want to see their play enacted, performed, because you don't know how well you understand the medium or the world you're seeking to represent unless you see it performed. And if you can't get it performed because you expect too much of the world you're imagining to appear on stage, it's not going to get performed. So that was a big thing that happened from the 70s onwards, still the case today. Right for um, uh, the minimum resources, how much can you produce, uh, how much can you get performed, get people to embody your characters without having to rely on all this other stuff to support it. It's not quite the same thing with the musical. And in, um, finally, in uh, the decades since the, the uh, turmoil of the 1960s, Many, many more plays are being written by actors themselves. They write their own materials. You have this connection between acting and performing and writing that was largely absent in previous decades. Not entirely. We had actors writing their own plays uh, earlier, but it's much more common now in a way that, you know, Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, Eugene O'Neill, they didn't act. They went to universities and then read all this literature and wrote their plays, uh, but not the case. Did they, 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 they were not actors. They were not, uh, you might say, in, on stage with the, uh, the cast and with the director and so forth. They participated in the rehearsals and the shows, but it's different when you are an actor and writing your material and when you are not. And uh, many, many more actors are um, uh, involved in the uh, construction of text uh, for the theater. And um, um, uh, establishing their identity uh, beyond what they do as performers, but as authors, as literary personalities, or literary personalities moving into acting. And uh, Wallace Shawn is a very good example of that, and we'll be talking about his play, Marie and Bruce, uh, in the next video. Um, uh, but uh, uh, that's the big point I want to leave with you uh, uh, in this video about the way in which actors have taken over or assumed greater responsibility for the words they speak than ever before.